Hello Internet! I'm the Disney Brain and welcome to Part 2 of In Space, the Franchise Savior. In Part 1, we discussed the first third of the season and how it built a strong foundation for the later episodes and plot points. With only a handful of exceptions, everything the first few episodes did sent a clear message of improvement. The pacing was better, the drama was better, and the way In Space used both to progress the story was nothing short of phenomenal. But. Before we get into the unraveling of the early story beats, let's discuss another prevalent aspect of this season that I believe gets at one of the themes this time around. The TMNT crossover may have been a spectacular failure, but the other Team Up episodes were just the opposite. True Blue to the Rescue is a great episode, because it perfectly conveys the best parts of Justin within the context of a better season. To the point where I wouldn't be surprised if his guest spot here made several fans go a little bit easier on him. Justin has always been sensible and fairly level-headed, despite also being a kid, but we know that he'll always be there to help, and his sense of genuine responsibility and thoughtfulness, traits very few kids his age have, have always been admirable. Well, except during Countdown, of course. But between how Turbo ended, and then how Justin's Ranger journey ended, the kid made as good of a last impression as he could. He may never be considered a great character, and for several valid reasons, but I'd never call him a terrible one either. Along those same lines comes the even better cameo episode, Always a Chance, which perhaps shares the title of Best Carlos and Best Adam episode. In it, Carlos loses his confidence after his attack goes not entirely as planned. What I liked about the initial trajectory is this. Not everyone can be TJ. Not everyone can wake up from a firm ass beating and then go look at the tape. TJ is heavily characterized by his even temperament, even in the face of overwhelming circumstances, but Carlos most certainly is not. And the most interesting thing about characters are the different ways they react to the challenges they face. That's what makes the Great Rangers more than just guys and gals in colorful spandex. And what works even better about Carlos's lack of confidence is how it's a perfect parallel to Adam's own struggles, because when it was him in the black or green, confidence was also a hurdle that needed clearing. So, who better to bring Carlos's confidence back than the guy who knows his problem firsthand, but also the guy that trusted Carlos to take the reins from him in the first place? This is the difference between what In Space did with its cameos versus what Super Megaforce tried to do with theirs. In one case, you have these character connections that make sense, but in the other, it just happens because fan service. And capping it all off was a moment of unadulterated awesome from the former Black Ranger. He risked destroying himself by morphing with a broken power coin just for a tiny window to help save the day again. This is what heroes do. Although, to be fair, the Zeo powers were never actually destroyed, so he'd probably have been better off if he held onto those instead, but minor details. With those moments, we see an interesting theme take shape, a theme of coming together, which is something all good teams eventually do, but just like In Space as a season, a seemingly basic idea is presented in a much grander way. You've got Mighty Morphin Rangers coming back, you've got Turbo Rangers coming back, and at both the beginning and the end of the season, you have villains and heroes alike joining forces. As such, a sizable part of In Space ends up being how both sides of this going on five year long conflict are coming together for the final fight. A fight that is naturally capped off with Countdown, which gives us a multi-planet war with the fate of the galaxy at stake. Without Tommy and a few choice others, it's technically a diet version of the legendary battle, but it means and represents so, so much more than the legendary battle ever could, and that's what helped make it the perfect season finale. But before we get too deep into that, let's now segue into the major plot points leading up to the finale before handling the finale itself in part 3, and we'll start with the silver space prankster himself. Darkonda and his involvement in the bigger story started us on the path of unraveling Andros' very depressing past, and in Survival of the Silver, we take the next step down that road as we learn how Zane became forever frozen. But turns out, all that he needed to wake up was a malfunction in the system that was supposedly keeping him alive. That's just a little weird, isn't it? And it didn't take Zane a long time at all to wake up afterwards and join the fight. The show never actually dives into the details, but I'll just throw this idea out there. I think Andros knew that Zane could have woken up at any time, 
Bup was too afraid to take the chance of stopping the healing chamber. If my theory about the rest of his former team having been lost in action is true, then that could easily explain his need to hold on to Zane as is and never take that risk. But with a little luck, it all worked out because of course it did. This is Rangers we're talking about. They would never give us a Ranger and then kill him off that same episode, right? <laughs> right? So if Zane now officially part of the team, we get uh, a love triangle. Oh. Oh no. Thankfully, it's very short-lived and only hampers the plot of one episode. And now the plot shifts focus onto Zane's inability to stay morphed, which makes sense because he's been frozen for a long, long time alongside his morpher. Although, kind of a dick move to play up the whole power struggle thing for sympathy points, I get that this is just who Zane is, and for the most part, his antics are hilarious, but that was just a little bit much for me but then he recharges his morpher, so he's good to go for the foreseeable future. Speaking of Zane's hilarious antics, the very next episode. This boy damn near snuck past Alpha to make his date with Astronema. That scene always gets a laugh out of me. And while I'd usually cry foul for his severe lack of responsibility, I mean, come on, it, it's Astronema here. Astronema. There's not many of these types of episodes, but it's pretty much guaranteed funny when you have one of the heroes dating one of the villains you kind of have to make certain elements more absurd for this to work, and I'd say both In Space and Time Force made it work. But now, here's why Date with Danger was an important episode, in addition to an entertaining one. The concept was played for laughs mostly, and that worked, but because of who Astronema is revealed to be, there's a little more going on here. Because before even Andros knew the whole truth, Zane could tell that Astronema was someone worth saving. You could say that's because Astronema is the stuff of space fantasies and Zane is a player by trade, but beyond even that, there was probably a level of humanity there that he felt. For as brash and as impulsive as Zane can be, I don't think he would have agreed to the date if he thought there was a good chance he'd have been ambushed or backstabbed. There was no traps. There was no backup monsters hiding behind the trees, just her diving headfirst into a scenario that was at the time completely foreign to her. This somewhat silly episode did a pretty great job at conveying Astronema as a multifaceted person and not just a villain. A person that was legitimately curious enough about the novel feeling Zane was bringing out of her to ignore her more sinister instincts, to the point where even after she firmly dumps him, she still finds herself pondering over the evening, trying to sort through what the experience really meant. Not to keep hammering away at lesser seasons, but this provides another interesting point of contrast, this time between the Princess of Darkness and the Princess of... meh. Ninja Steel's biggest, most consistent problem is pacing. Vera literally reforms a few minutes after she experienced with Sarah almost exactly what Astronema experiences with Zane. Both were raised almost their entire lives a certain way, but what helped make Astronema the greatest villain ever is patience. We already know she's a badass, but then they present her with these humanizing elements, these complicated feelings to sift through. Things aren't so simple now, and the show knows as much, which is why nothing resolves in mere minutes. Instead, they allow those feelings to sit for a few episodes, giving Darkonda a chance to try and get one over on the Rangers. And then we get the all-black team-up episode right after, and only after all of that do we now start to see the real structure of what the original foundation started building. First, the secret of the locket is finally revealed, confirming that Astronema has been coroned this whole time. Then, through some convincing by Andros, she slowly starts to recall her past. Next, Ecliptor could in theory put an end to her internal debate, but as we firmly established, Astronema comes before all in Ecliptor's mind. So instead, he makes it very clear that Astronema has a choice about who she is and who she can be. The irony being that Ecliptor himself doesn't believe he has that same choice. He's been so caught up in protecting Astronema and equating that to following his evil programming to a T that he never realized he already made that choice too. And this idea of choice is something we'll come back to because I think it represents a more internalized but also a more important in space theme. So, while Ecliptor is trying to rid the universe of Darkonda for good, Astronema continues to methodically buy into what Andros is telling her. This eventually leads to Andros trusting her enough to let her aboard the Astro Megaship. 
This was one of the only times, but also the most sensible time, to have a true to form disagreement between the current team leader and the former team leader. And it all adds up, because TJ is a more sensible person by nature, so he's not as convinced by what he perceives to be a rather sudden change of heart, nor are the others to a less vocal degree. And it doesn't help that Astronema's big plan involves trying to deceive Dark Spectre. If their trust in her ends up being misplaced, that's it. Game over. Evil wins. But before that, we get one of the more beautiful moments of the show, and I wish it had lasted longer, honestly. Astronema's in the midst of a very dynamic change, and one of the first things she wants to know is what her parents are like. The thing I often think about when thinking through Corone as a character is her family, and how devastated they must have been after what happened. Even today, Andro still keeps replaying that same horrifying footage, forcing himself to relive that horrifying memory. And I think that's because he places a lot of blame on himself for what happened. He probably keeps himself up at night, thinking about what if I had ran back to her just a little bit faster? What if we decided to play indoors that day? With that, Zane's former coma, and the very likely status of his former team, there's probably no ranger that balances intrigue and mystique the way Andros does, making it very fitting that he's also the ranger that most utilizes disguise and espionage as a means of acquiring information. Getting back to Astronema's plan, now that she's renounced her evil ways and accepted her given name of Corone, she leads the rangers to the planet where Zoran is being held captive. But, in a brilliant use of double deception, Dark Spectre baits the rangers and gets the drop on everyone. And now, Ecliptor does get to make that choice in a more pronounced way, as he sacrifices his own freedom to ensure that Astronema keeps hers. Most big bads at this point would throw some kind of temper tantrum while they ensure their underlings that next time, they'll get those meddling rangers. But Dark Spectre ain't Rita, so instead, he decides to launch a freaking asteroid at the Earth. To say things escalated quickly would be underselling it. But the newest member of the team knows a thing or two about how the other half lives, so she'd naturally be the best bet to sneak into the Dark Fortress and fix this sizable problem. Unfortunately, her choice to keep doing good is once again effectively quelled, but thankfully, we get Zane back in his brand new Zord to help out with moving that asteroid in part 2. With Corone finding herself in trouble, we get a cool little nod to the original Star Wars with Andros and Zane disguising themselves as Quantrons. But what they soon find is that Dark Spectre has taken away Corone and replaced her with an obedient Borg. And now, just as it was over a decade ago, Andros is forced to stand there and deal with the fact that he's lost his sister to darkness for a second time. And to make matters even worse, Ecliptor was reprogrammed, so his paternal instincts don't show up again until basically the very end. This five episode saga gives us so much information, but what it really highlights is the idea of choice that defined a lot of the season in general. In the two part premiere, Andros went against his instincts and chose to open himself up to a new team. They could have all died on him too, but to save Zordon and the galaxy, he needed to take that chance. And for Corone, you see the idea of choice represented more broadly by what she can choose and what she can't or didn't choose. Initially, through Zane, she starts making choices not predicated by her evil upbringing. And then, as time marches on, she realizes that evil and good is also a choice. This was such a perfect revelation for the Ranger franchise, because good and evil up until that point were framed very linearly. Every villain before Astronema was just evil with no real gray area. Even the Green of Evil arc was brought to light by a spell and not a choice. Adding to that, the do-gooder rangers themselves were never faced with many morally complex decisions, never made to rethink what may have seemed so clear in times past, but not here. For the first time, a ranger villain was allowed to be more nuanced than evil for evil's sake. For the first time, the main antagonist had to continuously wrestle against the conflicting thoughts and feelings she had always taken as givens. For the first time, a ranger villain was given a real choice about who she wanted to be. And for the first time, that choice allowed said villain to change and grow and to help the heroes fight off the true threat. It was an unprecedented ranger feat, a feat only two other ranger villains could ever match up to narratively, and only two. 
and it all comes down to a writing staff that made Crone a character first, and a dispenser of evil sounding gobbledygook second, and a distant second at that. This is also why the assimilation of Crone was the perfect counter to what she had gone through in her saga of conversion. The only way to beat who Crone was becoming and what her choices would do is to eliminate choice entirely. Dark Spectre may just be an obvious Malagor paint over to cut costs, but he knows what he's doing a lot of the time. And from a metaphorical perspective, he turned Astronoma into more of a by the books badass without any room for free flowing thought. Or, put another way, someone who now has a lot more in common with the previous allotment of villains. But, we were just starting to get to know the real Corone. We know who she is behind the machinery. So now, he put the Rangers, and us the fanbase, in the novel position of wanting the good guys to win, but not wanting Corone to lose, or Eclipter for that matter. In a season predicated on difficult choices, the question the Rangers now had to ask themselves is could they choose both? But in a season where there is no rest for the weary, the very next episode would bring with it the Psycho Rangers a brand new set of enemies that would push the rangers even further, so much so that at no point could they ever focus on another rescue mission. It was a difficult situation, made all the more daunting by their color-coded counterparts, making this the toughest ranger test ever, as it should have been. They wouldn't have saved the franchise if it were any other way. And in part 3, we'll finally talk in full about the unique challenge that was the Psychos, as well as how everything came together in the gold standard for season finales. And until then, thanks for watching.